The cases of the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Four in Britain are well known. Police framed Irishmen on terrorism charges, and this was later exposed and acknowledged by the government. Our next guest suggests Australia has its own example of this, called the Croatian Six. These men were arrested in 1979 and convicted on the basis of dubious physical evidence and unsigned confessions of planning to blow up Sydney's main water pipeline and the Elizabethan Theatre. Their convictions still stand today. Hamish MacDonald is the Asia-Pacific editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, where his story on this matter appeared. Hamish, welcome to the program. Thanks, Michael. The arrests occurred in February 79. What did the general Australian public know about Croatians at that time? Well, there was a very prejudiced view of Croatians. At that time, the prevailing wisdom was that Tito's Yugoslavia was a very progressive sort of communism. It split away from Stalin and had opened contacts with the West and tourism flowed in and out. The Croatians were seen as a throwback to a nasty period of World War II when under Italian and German occupation they were given a form of statehood and a local regime was set up uh, under a a fairly right-wing nationalist party. So they were tarred with a sort of Nazi stigma for a long time. Of course there was transportation of Jews out of Yugoslavia and I guess local collaborators would have assisted with that. So it was a very negative image for the Croatians. But the Croatians were the bulk of the Yugoslavs who came to Australia under the assisted migration scheme. So they're a very active, restive migrant population here. Mm, well, tell us a bit more about that. I mean, there was, there was virtually an independence movement going on, wasn't there, amongst Croatians towards Yugoslavia? Indeed, both here and in the United States and elsewhere, there was an active nationalist movement dedicated to overthrowing the Yugoslav Federation and regaining independence for Croatia. There was uh, several levels of that activity, some merely civil uh, protest outside Yugoslav consulates, very active ethnic press, and protests that disrupted official events and visits by Yugoslavian ministers or folkloric troops and so on. There was also an armed resistance movement which began training in the Australian bush. And in the early 70s, there were groups arrested, uh, one down near Eden in a national park who were training with weapons and in uniform Uh, And there had been a couple of armed incursions into Yugoslavia that were quickly spotted and and put down with bloodshed. And there were some explosions, uh, some bombings in Sydney or in Australia, weren't there? There was indeed. There was a a series of explosions in Sydney in uh, travel agencies linked to the Yugoslav airline and one in George Street that injured a couple of people very badly. So that was going on. Uh, There were seizures of some gelic night in the bush outside Melbourne at one point. So all of that led to this perception that there was a very dangerous right-wing extremist movement among the Croatians here. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about these six men who were arrested in this broader context in February 1979 in Sydney and Lithgow. Maybe we should start with what we might call a prosecution case. You know, as far as the general public knew at that point, who were they in a general sense and why had they been arrested? Right. Well, the prosecution case was that the six were involved in a plot to plant bombs around several targets in Sydney, as you mentioned, the Elizabethan Theatre, which was about to host some kind of Yugoslav folk group There were supposed to be a bomb planted on the water pipeline out at St Mary's that brought water down from the Warragamba Dam to Sydney and bombs at one or two other smaller targets like travel agencies. Now, this was brought to the notice of the New South Wales police by a seventh man who said he'd been involved in the plot but had had uh, qualms about it. He turned up at the Lithgow police station in February uh, 1979 and gave details to the local police. They immediately 
called down to Sydney. The alarms went off and a very heavily armed sort of SWAT group of police drove up to Lithgow. The informer was told to go back to the house where he lived with another alleged plotter, Max Bebich, and to carry on as normal. Later that evening, the police moved in and arrested the two and found some gelignite bombs connected to alarm clocks and so on in the boot of the informer's car. The second man, Max Bebich, then, according to the police, confessed to being part of the plot and gave the names of five others in Sydney. A second series of raids were organised on three houses across western Sydney that night, uh, about 10 o'clock. The police stormed into these houses and found identical sets of sticks of gelignite detonators and, uh, in one or two cases, some alarm clocks with the uh, face cut off and Mm. wires connected to the hands. And the police proceeded to interview these men, didn't they? And they also managed to to get confessions from them, although I don't think they were signed. Exactly. The five Sydney suspects were brought back to the CIB headquarters and interrogated by uh, teams of detectives from two of the very tough specialist squads of the CIB. And... After midnight, they were alleged to have confessed to being part of the plot and to have possessed the materials and to have explained what what it was all about. They were then charged at Central Police Station the next morning and the case proceeded from there. Max Bebich, the Lithgow suspect, was brought down to Sydney a few days later. Having signed a confession at Lithgow, The Sydney suspects did not sign confessions. Their confessions were allegedly written up by the detectives and a separate police inspector was brought in from Central to attest and sign that this was an accurate record of what they had said to the police. Mm -hmm. It was the old system that's now totally discredited, in in effect, what we now know as verbaling. Yeah, now one of the policeman involved, I think you've actually spoken with, Roger Rogerson, who went on to become famous in other contexts. What did he say to you when you put it to him that verbling had occurred on this occasion? Well, Rogerson, um, according to the court transcripts that I read through, was not present at the interrogation of the three suspects that his team arrested in one of the houses. So, uh, in a sense, he's clear of any suspicion of verbaling, or, but of course all three alleged that the explosives were planted by the police in their house. I had a long talk with Rogerson about this. In effect, he was the only policeman willing to talk. I approached several others and they either pleaded a memory loss or uh, said they didn't want to talk. But Rogerson said, well, look, if we were going to stitch them up, Uh, It would have been difficult because we had officers from three or more squads mixed up in the raiding parties, the special break-in squad, the hold-up squad, the surveillance observation squad, special branch and so on. And that he was saying that if you were going to uh, fit somebody up and verbal them, you'd want to have a close bunch of mates who you knew would not rat on each other. It's an interesting Uh, defence. And I uh, should say at this point, you said verbling occurred, but that's only a supposition at this point, isn't it? There's no firm evidence of that? Well, one of the suspects, Brajkovic, was so badly beaten that the photographs could not hide that. In fact, the photographs were disappeared. And then when he was taken to Long Bay the next day and referred to the hospital... The doctors and nurses on duty later testified in court that he had severe bruising around the face and the side of the head, uh, including an injury to one ear that they said was consistent with being kicked in the side of the head. That evidence was so compelling that the judge ruled that the alleged confession he'd made in the CIB could not be admitted as evidence, although that was not told to the jury. 
and an alleged confession he'd made on arrest at his house was allowed to stand, mm. even though the same police were involved. Yeah, right. mm. Just as a, a sort of a little side issue here, can you tell us about the fourth raid that occurred in Sydney on the 8th of February 1971, the one that never actually made it to trial? Yes, well, there was a, another uh, suspect whose name was not mentioned by Bebich, but whose name appeared out of somewhere, perhaps the special branch list of the usual suspects, one doesn't know. He was a young uh, engineering student living out in Western Sydney. A separate party of police raided his home later that night and brought him in. Uh, They allegedly found a number of detonators in the drawer of his desk. Now, he was produced in court a few months later in the central court for committal for trial, along with the others, But his lawyer, having got all the police to testify in court that they had found detonators in the desk of the drawer in the student's room, then produced photographs and evidence that the young man did not have a desk but a table without any drawers. Uh, The magistrate dismissed the charges. (laughs) I understand that you've gone and tried to find the transcript of that committal hearing. Uh, What did you find when you made that search? Well, I found thick folders of transcripts, daily cases for every day except that particular day. Nothing except the cover sheet listing the charges that were going to be heard uh, in the court. So uh, the conclusion is that it was sanitised. Now, the men were found guilty. In his summing up to the jury, Justice Maxwell told them that it was a black and white choice. Either the six men were guilty or 39 respected police officers had connived in a conspiracy. Do you think that was fair enough? Was it a black and white choice? He made it a black and white choice, partly by excluding the evidence that the police had beaten up at least one of the suspects or um, I mean there were allegations but he accepted evidence that they had beaten but that was held in a hearing uh, called voir dire which is when the jury is excluded and just the lawyers are in court and that was not presented to the jury. There were other aspects you know the, the informer there were suspicions that he was doing a deal with the Yugoslavs he wanted to go back to Yugoslavia so with that out it did become a fairly black and white choice for the jury. And in that time, it was before all the Rogerson stuff came out, the Ananda Marg case was overturned before the Wood Inquiry, before we really had ripped the veil off the uh, abuses that had crept into the New South Wales police. Mm-hmm. So the jury you know, had, as you say, 39 police all backing each other up and... Six men from a community viewed as prone to extremism and violence. They had an enormous security blanket around the courthouse with snipers on the roof and helicopters circling around and almost armoured vans on the streets outside. There was a tense atmosphere of threat, which was part of the theatrics of the prosecution. Mm -hmm. How did the media uh, treat the whole thing? The media, well, they varied from very straight and and questioning. The uh, Herald's John Slee reported it very straight and I think was showing some misgivings. The National Times picked up on some of the discordant vibrations coming out of it. But by and large, there was a cheer squad from the tabloid media and from the Bulletin magazine at that time, uh, the late David McNichol in particular, more or less saying that, you know, here was this valiant attempt by uh, brave judges and law officials to uh, crack this dangerous terrorist case. Okay, so that's the case for the prosecution, as it were. Let's now turn to the case for the defence. Let's talk a bit more about uh, this informer, Vico Verquez, What picture of him emerged during the trial? The picture of them emerged very doggedly through a lot of the efforts of the defence lawyers was of a very mentally troubled person who'd um, had a spell in the old Callan Park mental hospital after being picked up by police, someone who'd admitted being party to this plot, uh, mixing in Croatian radical circles, 
but also someone who had, on the very day of the blowing the alleged conspiracy, had been in touch with the Yugoslav consulate. And it also emerged during the trial that he desperately wanted to go back to Yugoslavia and that one of the problems was that if he did go back, he would immediately face jail for evading uh, military service. So he had a big incentive to get on side with the Yugoslavs. Now, he was whisked out of the country before the sentences were passed. He served a minor sentence at Parramatta Jail in isolation from the others and then had his Australian citizenship returned, issued with a new Yugoslav passport and escorted to a plane by some of the police involved in the case. So he disappeared and then it emerged people, he made remarks to one of the interpreters attached to the case saying that he felt very sorry but he had to do it and that he'd been in touch with an extremist Serb uh, nationalist movement. So already there were suspicions arising during the trial and the appeal. Was he actually a Croatian himself? No, he was not. He was a Serb who lived in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina Um, Was this known at the time of the trial? Well, not immediately. I mean, he was actually named something else. Vico Verquez was a pseudonym. So he was really masquerading as a Croatian. And that was dismissed. I think it started to come out during the trial, but it was dismissed as irrelevant. Mm. And even in the appeal when David Buchanan, one of the counsels for the defence, was trying to get subpoenas served on ASIO and the Federal Police and the Immigration Department to find out about him. And they were knocked back by the Federal Attorney General on national security grounds. I certainly would like to go to the Australian Mm. government's role in this a bit later. But just first, I mean, what did the the rest of the Australian Croatian community think about all this while it was happening? And apart from anything else, if they knew that that this character, the informer, was, um, was a Serb, they wouldn't have been happy with that, would they? It came out gradually. I I don't think they knew, but they all felt it was very wrong and there was a great sense of indignation. They felt very victimised, but, you know, they couldn't say much. There were police turning up jellic night and so on. But it sunk in and as more came out about Vico Verquez, the informant, I think it turned into a real sense of injustice over the yeah, years. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk just a little bit more about that. I think in 1991, the Four Corners journalist Chris Masters interviewed him in Yugoslavia. What was found out at that point about his role in the trial? Well, at that point, Masters got him to confess that he had been in touch with the Yugoslav consulate that he had been working for them and that he did think all of the six were not guilty. He did not actually confess to being an agent of Yugoslavia, but he did say that he thought all of the six were innocent. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, and so, o- of the terrorism. Yeah, mm. and so you've sort of come along and found out more about this. Can you tell us where the story goes from there? In fact, why did you first become interested? Well, it was quite accidental. As you mentioned, my job is watching Asia and the Pacific. So uh, it came up during the inquest into the Balibo 5 case in East Timor. And one of the former government lawyers who'd been attached to the Hope Royal Commission into Intelligence had some evidence that about suppression of alleged suppression of some intelligence material on the Balibo case. And he was asked by the coroner if he knew of any other case where intelligence had been suppressed. And he said, yes, there was a criminal case involving six defendants where the Interdepartmental Committee on Security in Canberra did know of stuff and where they had discussed what would happen if this material was subpoenaed and one of the members of that committee said, oh, well, if it's subpoenaed, the evidence will disappear. And another one said, well, this must not get to the Prime Minister, who was Malcolm Fraser at that time. So that was enough to whet my appetite and I I thought, well, there's a big hint being thrown out here. Somebody wants something to be dug into and I thought, you know, no one else was picking (laughs) it up, so I would. 
What about that lawyer you talked about? Was it Ian Cunliffe? At the Ian, Ian Cunliffe, the... who went on to a very distinguished career. He became Secretary of the Australian Law Reform Commission. He personally is convinced that it's an injustice comparable to the Birmingham Six or Guildford Four cases. I, mean, I guess the theory here is that Verquez may have been some sort of agent provocateur working for the Yugoslavian Secret Service. If that were the case, it would certainly not be unique. They were known to operate in that manner around the world, weren't they? Yes. Well, the other new thing that's come out is that an American expert on the Balkans, uh, John Schindler, who was the Balkan expert with the American National Security Agency in the 1990s during the, the wars and the subsequent hunt for war criminals... He's now moved to the U.S. Naval War College as a professor in terrorism-related subjects, and he's preparing a book which will be coming out exactly about Yugoslav agent provocateur activities. And he has told me that among the senior members of the former uh, Yugoslav State Security Agency, the UDBA, uh, the Croatian Six case is regarded as perhaps their greatest triumph, that through a single agent provocateur, they managed to bring down the full weight of Australia's law enforcement agencies on six known activists, get them swinging jail terms and utterly discredit the whole Croatian nationalist movement for many years in the eyes of the Australian public. And Schindler has good sources for this? He has spoken directly to a number of senior former UDBA officials who have said this to him. Okay. Hamish, what do you know about what the Australian government knew or might have known about this at the time? I think it seems pretty clear that they were keeping tabs on the Yugoslav missions in Australia and tapping phones and watching them. In fact, there was a federal police liaison with probably some of their security people. I think they are protecting knowledge of this agent provocateur uh, activity and of the informer's contacts with known UDBA uh, representatives on the di diplomatic staff here. So they were trying to protect their trade secrets, uh, even at the cost of letting these innocent men go to jail for 15 years. Which they certainly did, and their sentences and their convictions still stand. Do you have any hope at this point that something might be done about that by our government? I, I do. Um, three of the six have applied to the New South Wales Chief Justice for a judicial review of the convictions, for all of the convictions. One or two are holding back. Um, one is believed to be dead. There is a support movement gathering among the Croatian-Australian community because they see this as not just for six people but for all of them of indication that they need. We have to leave it there, Hamish, but it's an absolutely fascinating story and I think a very important one. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>